Welcome to To Knock Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of TNT, The Twisted New Testament, with Rabbi Stuart the Man Federal, based on his books, Judaism and Christianity, A Contrast, now available in three different languages. Isn't that lovely? Welcome back, Rabbi. How are you this afternoon? This ah, thank God. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm playing with our volume levels again. All right, tonight's title, again, uh, Why is the Blood of Jesus Just Cheap Grace? That is a really valuable question. Um, and just to just to add the first reflection on that, uh, cheap grace, because it's like I've always been wondering why, h- how just believing in somebody. I mean, I did it. I was a Christian for years. I followed through with it. I had the emotional connections and all this other stuff, but it never made sense to me how someone could just go and steal from somebody and just ask God to forgive them, and they're forgiven, but they don't have to do anything to fix it. And it's, it's always and, bothered and, me, you know. Um, and here, here's, here's the issue. William, as far as I'm concerned, okay? okay sure. Christians will say, oh, no, that's not true. There's no such thing as cheap grace. Because if there's not a change in your in your behavior, if you don't become a better person, a nice person, a good person, okay, then they, however they want to word it, they say, then, then you're really not a Christian. Right. Okay. Yep. Except the problem is, is go take a look at any church's systematic expression of their beliefs. What I sent you, what you have or will have up on the screen, is, is right yeah. off of a Southern Baptist church. And, and wow, okay. But, but let, let's talk a little bit first about the idea of cheap grace. Okay. It's all, some call it cheesy, cheap grace and some call it easy grace. And, and what does that mean? What is that about? Okay, first of all, there's, there's a German theologian. Turn of the ninth, turn of the twentieth century, nineteen hundred, early nineteen hundreds, named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he wrote a book called *The Cost of Discipleship*. And in that, uh, he defined cheap grace or easy grace as preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus. Okay? In other words, you don't have to do anything. Jesus does it all for you. And he says, Mm -hmm. oh, no, that's not what Jesus was talking about. That's not what the New Testament says. Well, (laughs) bring up up the uh, quotation from the Baptist church. Okay. Okay, All right. and it's long. It's long. So this is labeled question three, but it's but because two of the questions didn't apply to the show. This, this so you guys don't let that weigh. Well, we're question one and two. Right, this is it. on your screen now. What must I do to be saved? In a exactly. word, there is only one thing you must do to be saved. You must believe. The end. That's it. There's and we're going to go through this quotation from. Gateway Baptist Church. I'm not even sure what city it is. There's okay. plenty of gateway churches all over the place. Okay. Apologize for but, that. Let me fix this. But, but the first question is, why do I need to be saved? Because you're a sinner. Mm-hmm. Question number two is, what did God do to save me? He died for your sins or he sent his son, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But the interesting thing to me is question number three. What must I do to be saved? So I, I have a, a mild objection. I think the very first question w- would be a really great one to discuss. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you as know, as that goes, but, but because but the idea of cheap grace is that you don't have to do anything to be saved. Right. But but the church painting the idea that you have to be saved to begin with is a problem. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's true too. Yeah. All right, carry on, Rabbi. So what must I do to be saved? In a word, there's only one thing you must do to be saved. You must believe. Right, and the, and nothing else. And we are going to race through this Christian number three question. Okay. Now, do I scroll in this? In this, it's all in the text, would, right? Would you mind? Absolutely. It, it, I just think it would be better. Yeah, that's not a problem. At all. all right, you okay. just you could just start reading it, and I'll I'll follow you. Oh, I scroll way too fast. Hold on. Go okay, retriever right. here. Okay, you can start reading. Well, I'll catch up with you in a minute. All right. Well, here's what the new. Sorry, here's what the Christian Church says. The Evangelical Church says. Okay. Question number three. We already talked about the first two. What must I do to be saved? In a word, there is only one thing you must do to be saved. You must believe. And then they bring the quotation from Acts chapter sixteen, verse thirty-one. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Period. Now, disregarding the fact that they don't understand translations and how prepositions work going from one language to another, okay, when they're translating all as on, because they don't realize when you switch to the English language, you have to use the preposition that goes with the English uh, uh, verb, uh, be that as it may. It goes on to say, to believe means to trust in, to put your faith in, to count on as being true. But let me caution you, anybody can say, I believe. In fact, the Bible says even the demons believe and tremble, James 2.19. I want you to understand the kind of belief that leads to salvation. To, believe, to begin with, believing is always believing in something. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ means to believe in or trust <clears throat> in what Christ did for you as your only hope of salvation. It means to be under the conviction that if you do not trust in Christ alone, then you will be lost forever. It means to believe in the gospel. The term gospel means good news about what Christ did for you. Notice the emphasis on what Jesus did for you. Nothing is said in this entire section from this evangelical Baptist church about what you have to do. It never demands a thing of your behavior. It never demands anything of you to, I don't know, go to the person against whom you have sinned and talk to them and, 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 and uh, reconcile with them and do what you have to do, jump through their hoops, do what you have to do to obtain from them directly the forgiveness, you know, for the person against whom you have sinned. Okay, the Apostle Paul the Apostle Paul talks about the Christian gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which you also are saved. What is that gospel which Paul preached to them, which they received, they believed in, and by which they were saved? The gospel is four statements about Jesus. Okay, these statements represent the very trust, the very truth with which you must believe in order to be saved. Christ died for our sins. He was buried Okay, he rose again the third day, and he was seen. Where there, where in anything that I just read, does it say anything at all about what the believer has to do? Yeah. And Christ, Christians will say, oh, the book of James. L look at James. Without, without works, faith is, uh, uh, you know, doesn't mean much. I forgot the exact. Romans 2.13 okay. says the same thing, basically. I'm sorry, what? Romans 2.13 says basically the same thing. Which is what? Oh, let me pull it up. I, I remember the citation. I can't remember the exact words, but it, it says, um, let me just look at it. Bam. Papa Gateway. Let's go to Romans 2.13. It says, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law are justified. Which means if you do the law, you haven't sinned. If you haven't sinned, Right. What, is it, what does it mean to be justified? The law does yeah. not justify you, nor did Judaism ever claim that doing the law justified. What does justify mean? It means to take away your sin to enable you to get heaven. So in the next uh, of what it says, after these four statements about what Jesus did for you, it says, secondly, to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins means that you are repenting of your sins and turning to Christ. Oh, well, no, wait a minute. If it says repenting of your sins, does it mean that go through the process of finding forgiveness and talking to the person against whom you've sinned? No, it doesn't. The, the This church and their explanation of what must I do to be saved goes on to say to repent means to change your mind. The only reason for you to believe in Christ is if you have changed your mind about your sin. You are ready to believe in the gospel only if you are convicted by the realization that your sin offends the holy God of heaven and you want to be rid of it forever. So all it means to repent from their perspective is not to stop doing the bad, start doing the good, not to feel sorry for the fact, not to make amends as best you can, but simply to understand that your sin, that what you've done that was bad against other people was an affront to God. Are you still reading or are you just explaining? I'm sorry, what? Were you just were you explaining or just reading? Uh, well, I read and then I explained. Okay, that's what I thought. I will make sure I wasn't I was not scrolling or scrolling in the right places. Okay, you're still on right. two. Just finished up with two. Gotcha. Okay, three. He rose again on the third day. Right, and after and after it says he rose again on the third day. Okay, statement four is he was seen. That means witnesses of Jesus are proof of his new life. He was resurrected. 
How many witnesses exactly? <laughs> and were there witnesses based on the contradictions? That's that's a big question. And, and what did they witness? And yeah. who did they witness? And and it, it, it's such a. I tell you what. I tell you exactly what I think. I really believe this with everything that's in me. I I don't believe that Jesus died from being hung on the cross. I think that when they took him off the cross, he was still alive. I think they put him in the tomb, and he recovered there. And when he came out, he had the wounds in him because he got hung up on a cross. But he never died from that. I, I just I don't see that happen. After six between six and nine, or three and nine hours hanging on the cross, when it was a three day execution, they had it down to a science. It took three days, and Jesus, after three to six hours or three to nine hours, supposedly died from it. I don't think so. There is a book, and of course, I can't remember the name of the book, <clears throat> where it shows all these things taken right out of the Gospels that basically show exactly what you're saying. For example, wow. uh, before he died, he was given, uh, depends on which version you want to believe, vinegar, vinegar with myrrh. Oh, yeah. Vinegar, right. Okay. And according to this this novel novelization, uh, what he was actually given was a drug to make him look like he died. Oh, that would not surprise me either. Yeah. And then he gets taken off. It's not a great book, but yeah. I can't remember the name right. of the book, by the way. Uh, but basically, yeah. it is a taking everything that the New Testament says of what happened in the well, as close as they can get to the order. Depends on which gospel you look at, and then basically shows what could have happened to make it look like Jesus died and came back to life. All right. <clears throat> okay, okay, so someone in, uh, uh, and I won't do this a lot, but I just noticed uh, Kenneth Buckwalter in chat said that recent apologetics say 500 witnesses. But the more I follow these podcasts, the more I question, the more questions he has. Good so, because there was nowhere, no way there was 500 witnesses of that. Even even if there were 500, yeah. how many witnesses saw Elvis? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, if, if, if your faith is so strong... Yeah. You don't want to believe that you were wrong by following yeah. the wrong Messiah because the Messiah is not supposed to die. Right. And so your psyche yeah. takes over. It's, it's called and, uh, cognitive dissonance. And you ask, what did they witness? That's very important. Again, I think they witnessed. They might have witnessed him walking around after after he you know, recovered from the tomb. doesn't mean he was resurrected. And, you know. and it doesn't mean it was actually him. Right. That's kind but, of like and, the, and all of this is conjecture because it, it is taking as fact the New Testament, yeah, uh, uh, gospels. The same thing goes with the uh, as it is. same thing with the Shroud of Turin. They're they're trying to say that's proof that that. Was, first of all, the Shroud of Turin doesn't prove anything except that there was a man inside that cloth. Doesn't does, it, doesn't it, prove it, who it, it was. Doesn't, doesn't mean, prove that he was mean, resurrected. It just means that there was somebody it underneath the cloth. Doesn't even mean there was a man in the cloth. Oh yeah. The earliest church, when they came out with the Shroud of Turin, the church labeled it a fraud. Oh, right, right. And then they thought better of it because, hey, if it they, increases yeah, faith, let's keep it point. around. Ah, right, right. You know, read up on the history of the Shroud of Turin. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, yeah. and there are so many problems with the Shroud of Turin. But, hey, if your faith is weak, then you need stuff like the Shroud of Turin to revalidate your faith. Mm -hmm. All right. All so, right. Joel C. Solomon, uh, your comment there says a drug that would induce unconsciousness would quickly kill someone on a cross since he would not be able to pull himself back up to breathe. The, the, the issue there isn't even that drug. The, the fact is they pulled him off the cross between after three to six hours, not three days. That's, well, that's the big issue for me. Well, first of all, wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. If, if the drug slows down his breathing and slows down his need for breath... Okay, then yeah, he can look look like he's dead. Okay, second of all, uh, he was a carpenter. He wasn't just some random person. Yeah. He was incredibly physically fit. And the idea that someone, the other people that were up on the cross with him, that were crucified at the same time with him, okay, he was already dead. The the carpenter, okay, the athlete. But but the thieves who were probably not very you know uh, physically fit were still alive and had to have their legs broken, which by the way means they suffered yeah. more than Jesus because they had to suffer the breaking of their legs. Right. Whereas Jesus never had that happen to him, so he never he suffered less. So, 
right? Yeah, no, I don't think it, it, it makes much sense. Yeah. Okay. Miriam Levinson says, why would James have led the Christians for 20 years if Jesus was still alive? I didn't say he didn't die. I just said I don't think he died from the cross. I think he went off and died somewhere. And, and again, you are accepting as fact the New Testament as written. Yeah. Which is your privilege. You yeah. know, if they want to do that, go right ahead. But there are so many contradictions within the text of the New Testament. You know, we, we just finished with the uh, uh, Passion narrative. There are no less than 30 contradictions in the short space of the Passion narrative in the New Testament. You know, and as, as you know, they can't, they can't figure out when Mary Magdalene uh, realized that it was Jesus they can't figure out the last words that Jesus had. There are four different renditions of what he said right before he died. Uh, yeah. How right. do you trust any of it? Right, right. But but the, the point to our conversation is in all of what I am reading, which is somewhat boring, by the way, but <laughs> everything I am reading from this church that talks about what must I do to be saved, yeah, right. okay, um, they, they promise you there's nothing you personally can do to obtain salvation except believe. But then once you believe, nothing is asked for you, from you. Nowhere in what I am reading does it say anything at all right. about the need to repent, real repentance. Right. Okay? Recognize you've done something wrong. Feel sorry for the fact that you've done something wrong. Make amends as best you can with certain limitations, and then don't do it again when you've given the possibility of doing it again. Yeah. Choosing not to. Right. Okay. So we're on, are we on statement four? No, we did four already, right? Right. Okay, okay. so we're going to go on to... But, but my point was, is that when they, when they say that you have to repent... To believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins means you are repentant of your sins. Their understanding of repentance means that you are ready to believe in the gospel only if you are convicted by the realization that your sin offends God. That's all that repentance means right. to them. By this specific text. Okay? Mark right. one fifteen, repent and believe in the gospel. Luke twenty four forty six to forty seven. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations, <clears throat> beginning in Jerusalem. Where does it say that you have to go to the person against you have sinned and reconcile with them? Not there. Right. And that's the excuse me. That's the definition of cheap grace. Yeah. You don't have to do anything but believe, and God does it for you. Okay? By the way, please notice what it says as it begins Acts chapter 3, verse 19, if you can make sure to have that up on the, uh, up on the, uh, on, the, on the screen, where it begins with Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Okay, well, Acts 3, 19, got it right mm -hmm. now. It's on the screen, yeah. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When you truly believe the gospel, God saves you through a wonderful transaction that has two parts. First, God removes the guilt of your sins, just like a financial debt that is, debt that is paid in full. Your sin debt has been transferred to Christ who died in your place. You are completely free from the guilt of your sins. No matter how many, no matter how awful the sins, Christ has paid the debt in full. Okay, Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Colossians 2, 13 to 14. And you being dead in your trespasses, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Second, God gives to you the righteousness of Christ himself, just as your sins are transferred to Christ, Christ's righteousness is transferred to you. You didn't do a thing. All you did was believe. Yeah. All you did was say, I believe. And all of a sudden, you get this forgiveness transferred to you because righteousness is transferred to you without lifting a finger. Maybe that's why well, this woke movement is so easy for people to, to fall into. Because all you have to do is believe that you're a woman and you can identify as a woman. Or believe that you're a right. dog. 
I mean, and that yes. sounds ridiculous, but it's kind of how that's it's honestly almost how ridiculous this is with the New Testament, though. It really is. You know. Okay, and, so and, and, go ahead. Sorry. Nope, nope. Go ahead. I want to finish this, and I'm gonna. I've got a, a question highlighted. I'll come back to. All right. The point that I'm making in all of this is that in everything this pass that this church says about what you have to do to be saved, you have to do nothing except believe. There's no act on your part. Do you realize the heavy contrast with Judaism, with the Bible, with what God actually said first? Hmm. I guess that means God must have changed his mind. Right. You know, what, what, did, what did the people of Nineveh do? Okay? Uh, Jonah, the book of Jonah, the, the, the city of Nineveh is three days' journey from one end to the other. Okay? And... Uh, uh, Jonah only goes uh, Jonah only goes one day into the city so he's not even in the middle of the city okay uh, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said in 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown that's all he says and what exactly happens what do the people do okay uh, the word came to the king uh, of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, covered himself with a sackcloth, and sat in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. What do we call that? Fasting. Fasting. What do we do on Yom Kippur? We fast, 25 hours. Yep. But let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily to God. What do we call that? We call that prayer. And what do we do all day in Yom Kippur? We pray. Yea, let them turn every way from his, every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in, in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? So they fast, they pray, and they stop doing the bad and start doing the good. And then what does it say? John, Jonah, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. And God saw their works, not yep. their faith, not that they prayed in the right name, not that they accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, Son of God, and, and Messiah, but God saw their works. What works? That they turned from their evil way. Again, Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. And God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did not do it. Hmm. So here you have clear evidence and this is repeated throughout the, the Bible, the Tanakh, uh, that all you have to do is stop doing the bad, start doing the good, confess, repent, and God forgives you. The end. Yep. So when they say that when they say that your when they say that your uh, 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 actions cannot lead to salvation, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so earlier. Uh, Christo said something that was funny, um, true-ish okay. though. Uh, let me let me go back to it here in one second. Uh, let me keep going. Did I, went, I think I went too far. Hang on. Yeah, I went too far. Um, it says, um, so if all our sins are transferred. Now, the reason why I'm pulling this question up now, I have another question I want to bring up, but this one I wanted to put in because okay. I thought it came with it. Uh, if all the sins are transferred to Jesus, then Jesus is a <laughs> sinner according to the Christians. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, but Christo, not, perfect. My, my thought with that is, the idea is that you know we, that, that Jesus bore all of our sins. They're, they're, they make T-shirts out of this thing, right? But the problem with that is the only stories in Tanakh where a goat uh, had had where they laid the hands on the goat's head and transferred all the sins of the people wasn't on Passover or Easter. It was on Yom Kippur, right? And that goat never died. They just sent it away. Well, let me rephrase that. According to the Bible, according to Tanakh, they just sent that goat out into the wilderness that's the end of the story okay right that's where uh, so, the ritual that's yeah. where the required ritual yeah. ends right right and so right. uh so everything so far still about jesus doesn't work according to tanakh uh, they kind of have to have to rewrite their own thing okay and then uh sarah asked a question earlier and this is a question i think she may have asked or somebody else may have asked prior uh, which is a really, really interesting question if you think about it. So let me read it, and then I'm gonna, I'll kind of add something to it. What was it specifically about Jesus that made people turn to him into a god? Why not some other random human being 
and I'll say, she didn't say this part, but I'm saying another random righteous person, so to speak. Why, why not someone else? Why Jesus? Uh, like all the people, Jesus seems to be not, he would seem like one you wouldn't pick. So why Jesus? Why was he so successful at this Messiah syndrome that it actually worked with Christians? Well, there's a whole bunch of different ways to go about answering that question. I have a thought. Okay. What's your thought? My thought is because the message that comes with Christianity is so use is so common with pagan idolatry that they, were, that they were already willing to accept that and believe that to begin with. And because the message of true Judaism is hard. It's harder because you got to, you, you, you don't get off the hook just by believing you got to go pay somebody back and you got to make sacrifices and all this exactly. other stuff. Exactly. Make them. That's, that's pain. why go I think Jesus person and talk to them about yeah. what you've done. Right. That's yeah. exactly right. You right. know, that, that, that look, if I'm a pagan 2,000 years ago, okay, I'm an idolater, I'm a Roman, Greco-Roman citizen, whatever, okay, and somebody comes to me and tells me about this man whose mother was human, whose father was a god, namely, you know, like Zeus, okay, who died for my sins and takes away my sin away, why is that new? I've heard it before. Right. I've heard it with Perseus, who, yeah. whose mother was... Was Danaea, whose father was Zeus, whose whose father Zeus made Danaea pregnant with Perseus without a sex act, which means it was like a virgin birth. Yeah. So, so it's nothing new to me, and I have the advantage of now believing in something that you know gets attached to the Hebrew Scriptures. So now I can believe something that goes all the way back to creation instead of just be. be blah, blah. In just, instead of just believing that two gods had a fight and poked a hole in the in the ceiling, that it was capriciousness that created the universe. Okay, so the, the and by the way, where did the where did the Christian community, the disciples, where did they go in order to preach their gospel? They went to the port cities where people are coming and going. Ooh. All over the world, all over mm -hmm. the European, all over the Mediterranean world, let me put it that way. So if they wanted to carry their message to the islands of Greece, okay, you go to a port city and you're going to preach to people who are going to take the message that they've heard before and they're going to bring it to the port cities. Mm -hmm. They're going to bring it to the other islands. They're going to take it from the port cities and go inland with it. So when you have Corinthians letter to the people of Corinth, the Christians of Corinth. If you have <coughs> um, uh, <coughs> Thessalonia, okay, Thessalonians. If you have, uh, all of those letters are to already existing Christian communities in, in the Mediterranean Greco-Roman world. Nothing new, and that's why this Jesus caught on. And why did they turn this person into a god? Because all of the gods of the ancient world were part human, part God. Hercules, his mother was human, Alchemy, and his father was Zeus. It's, it's nothing new to them. They had heard it before. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we got to get back on your list. We are at, uh, did you go Mark one fifteen, Luke 24, X 319 yet? Uh well, we kind of jumped over it, so, you know. Okay. Are we done with the list? I, I, I think we're done. I think I, I think we pretty okay. well explained. And look, if they, okay. if they want to see it, okay, then go to Gateway Baptist Church, which is gatewaytr.org. Gatewaytr.org. How can I be saved? Or just do a, just do a, uh, here's a, here's a challenge for you. Go to Google. Type in, how can I be saved? What must I do to be saved? <clears throat> Look at any and all churches okay. <clears throat> and what and how they answer it and ask yourself in any of their descriptions where they say you must go to the people against whom you have sinned and re reconcile with them. Sure. Talk to them about your, your what you've done, how, right. how you're truly sorry. Not a generic, ooh, if I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I ever did anything wrong to you. Yeah. Okay. But, but an actual, hey, I know I did this, and I'm really sorry, and I, I want to make amends as best I can, and I I'm, I'm promise I'm a different person. I'm not going to do it again. Right. 
Go uh, go show that to me on on a church's, you know, where they describe what you have to do to be saved. I guarantee you, all they're going to say is is believe in Jesus and that's all you have to do. Right. Which is exactly what Bonhoeffer was talking about when he used the term cheap grace. <coughs> right. Yep, that makes sense. Um, okay, so I want to comment real quickly on uh, on a. F uh, actually, we've got Judy calling in from the Shroud of Turin. I'm sure that's probably what we're going to be discussing. You want to take that? Yeah, I don't care. It's fine. Okay. All right, uh, Judy, sit tight. Be right back with you. Sit tight. Um, so first, I want to comment with uh, um, Rev. Robbins. He's been following for a long time. He was an ex-pastor, ex-reverend, um, struggling with uh, the fear of you know disconnection from God. I'm trying to find his comment here. Um, the only thing I can, the, the thing that comes to mind first, let me find his comment here. Eight thirty-two. Maybe so. Oh, I, I scroll way too far. Oh yeah, there we go. I'm struggling with belief in God. Uh, I don't want to be afraid of God and serve Him out of fear of hell. It's wrong. Uh, is it wrong to doubt? Need wisdom. Okay. Um, so the fear of hell is is that's that's definitely a uh, something that baggage that people who were Christian uh, will bring with them. They bring with them, and it's and it's hard to shake. Uh, color shit. I'll be right back. Uh, it's it's very hard to shake. Um, but the thing is, you've got to shake it because the fear of hell that that's that's really a scare tactic of Christianity. You know, if you're struggling with belief in God. Um, I I would challenge you to go back and rewind uh, the events in your life because uh, I, I can tell you I've, I've had more things that people would call coincidences happen. I mean, very, very specific, deep, deep-rooted coincidences. There's no way it could be coincidences happen. There's no doubt in my mind that Hashem is real and that He's He's got His eyes on all of us. Um, so I, I challenge you to go back and look at things, even the bad things. Sometimes good, bad things happen to prevent you from doing something stupid, you know. So <laughs> I could tell you, I could tell you right now. So I would just challenge you to go back and revisit those. Um, if you're if you're struggling with like depression because of all this stuff, um, you may just need to spend more time meditating and 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 in study and you know tour study and and getting back in mind. I do see a lot of people who fall into this uh, struggle when they tend to not. Christian backslide, that's not what I mean, but when they start to, to just not focus on God as much and they get wrapped up in the worldly things and um, and they tend to it tends to take a pretty heavy toll on your on your psyche for sure. So uh, with that, but be encouraged because there, there's no fear of hell on that. Uh, there's there's very select people who are going to hell and we will will never have part in the world to come and you're not one of them, I can promise you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's for the super evil in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, there are specific, specific categories of people. You're yeah. not one of them. Right. Okay, and, and, and there are also different interpretations of that concept where there's a punishment, but what does God get out of torturing you for eternity? Your, your soul ceases to exist. Annihilation right. of the soul. Yeah. Okay, because you've tainted so far, so much this, this, but that ain't you. Yep. Okay, and and, and it, it it amazes me how when people reject Christianity, they still keep the stuff, the junk, the crap that they learned from Christianity, even though they know in their heart of hearts or simply by reading that mm. what they learned from Christianity doesn't exist. Right. Show me hell. In the Tanakh, mm -hmm. the way Show the Christians me. teach it, yeah. That's what I'm. That's yeah, by definition, yeah. Yeah. words yeah. have definitions. The word "hell" is a specific term for eternity of torture, as a punishment in a eternal punishment in the next life for the sins committed in this life. Mm -hmm. That's what the word means. That does not exist. Is right. there a punishment in the next life? Absolutely. Does the punishment fit the sin? Absolutely. Is there a limitation of time for that punishment? Absolutely. By definition, therefore, it cannot be called hell. Right. So and that's that's the issue. My 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 understanding of of the current understanding, even even before, uh, my understanding of, of hell wasn't the the evil place of eternal torment. Torment being key, it was more like taking a hot bath, like a hot shower, or like you know if. If you find gold, the only way to purify gold is to is to put it under fire, and it separates all the impurities from it. And right, once all the but, impurities but are gone, and then that a, yeah, it's painful. Yeah, whatever the case may be. But the point is that the process isn't to destroy you; it's to purify you. 
and whatever purity you've got left, if you want that 24 karat gold, you may have a lot of junk come out with that. It may take you longer, you know. So and, that's and kinda, that purification process isn't necessarily heat. Right. Right. And, and as we've said repeatedly on our show, if the flesh and blood, okay, if the flesh and blood turns to dust, goes back to dust from which it came, and the only thing that f continues after life is spiritual, how can something that is spiritual burn? Mm -hmm. it, it, it makes no sense. Right. It's purely metaphorical, no doubt. All right. But, but let me, William, I, I have to respond to something else that Reverend Robbins said, and that is he's struggling with the belief in God. And this too, I believe, is a result of leaving Christianity. Because so often has the Christian definition of God been drilled into a person's mind that when they reject the Christian concept of God, they think they are left with no God. So therefore they doubt the existence of God because the Christian God that they have been believed in, that they have believed in up until this point, they no, no longer believe in, so now they think they're atheists. You, you, am I making sense here, William? All right, okay, so. All right, sorry, Rabbi, I'm back. Here we go. All right, but that his first statement is, I'm struggling with belief in God. My point was that Christians have a concept of God that when they create, when they reject Christianity, they think they are left with no God. And, and and what I'm saying is is that the Christian concept of God isn't even the biblical concept of God. And so when you reject Christianity, you can still have God. Yeah. So don't don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Don't throw out. The, all beliefs in God, at the same time, you, you, you get rid of the Christian concept of God, which is dying, saving, man, God, God becomes man, man becomes God, however you want to understand that, and it's yeah, it, 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 it's not biblical God. Okay, Rabbi, you good? I, I think so. Okay, all right, I'm going to bring uh, Judy into the call now. Okay, Judy, go ahead now. You're live on the air. Okay, good. How are you? I won't look at the screen. <laughs> it's um, okay. Right. I want to preface this with I have a. I'm coming from a different angle tonight. Uh, I just want you to assume I believe what I believe, whether you think I'm crazy or unintelligent, whatever. Let's just assume there's a chance I'm right. I I know in my heart I'm right, but you guys think I'm not. But I want you to understand... Exactly. We know you're wrong. But go ahead. Okay. So my, I want you to understand motivation. Right now, we're going to be more than likely very soon going into a tribulation. Now, I'm not whack, but I'm saying based on what's going on in the Mideast, Christians that really follow, we always watch Israel. Israel is where, where it's at. Israel is... We always base God's moves, next moves, on what's happening with Israel. We acknowledge Israel is the apple of his eye. We give you all that. However, I'm not an expert, but just hear me out. Based on Daniel 12, uh, Ezekiel, some of the Tanakh scriptures, there's a prophecy concerning difficult times, which you've been through already, but there's a time that's coming that made Daniel sick. Right? So the Christians who are serious, a lot of them and the, the, a lot of the scholars, believe that the Jewish people are going to have to endure the seven-year tribulation. Christians will too, but there are certain Christians that if they make themselves ready, there's what we call the rapture. So just hear me out. I know you, you have theories about that too. So my motive is I don't want Jewish people to go through this horrible seven-year tribulation. And if I'm right, I want to convince you, because according to our Bible, there will be, there will be a revelation. Now, I've listened to you a lot of tonight, from the Shroud of Turin to the thing about just believing the thing with belief is, it's just like if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, are you going to disobey him? No. 
And it's just like if you believe Jesus, are you going to obey him? Yes, that should follow. Otherwise, it's unlikely that you believe. So there is repentance to believe, but it's sort of like summing it up. If you believe, then you're baptized, you've already repented, and you become born again. It's not an easy walk. Jesus says there's a, it's a narrow route. But as far as the Shroud of Turin, I'll just insert. I'm not promoting. Real, Nobody knows real, my name. Real so quickly, real quickly, you did say something important. I wrote a book on it, and you, what you're saying Judy, is... Judy, you did say something that was kind of important. I think that should comment. You said that Jesus said, you know, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few bear, the, there be that find it. Uh, and as it turns out, Christianity is the largest denomination of religious beliefism on the planet right next to islam so there's a little conflict there that all christians are going to have to deal with right they're not all going to the right place they're you, you're, you're, you're missing my point um <laughs> christians in general um you know they say that they believe in jesus and they follow jesus but they don't they don't i mean if you look at all the teachings of jesus um, and most of them don't even do what he said to do. In fact, uh, I, bl I believe Jesus even said when it comes to uh, like miracles and stuff, he said, these things that I do, you will do even greater because you go, uh, you do things in, in his name, right? Well, whatever the case may be. Well, he was healing, casting out demons. Why aren't people going into hospitals and healing the sick? Why are the hospitals getting rich off of Christians? If, if Christianity is true, and if Jesus is true, why why are things like this being overlooked? And I'll tell you why. It's because that makes Christianity look bad, so they don't bring it up and they don't discuss it. Well, can I say something to that? Sure. Jesus couldn't heal where, where there was unbelief. So you of course there's going to be, a, there's, there's got to be a, some sort of damage control to protect them. It's kind of like this guy, Sammy Messiah. We had a Sammy the Messiah guy came on with me and Greg. And uh, he says, I am the Messiah. I'm the, I'm, I'm the ancient one. And uh, I will be sitting on my throne come July 1st or whatever the date was. And uh, we asked him, so what happens if July 1st comes and you're not sitting on your throne? He goes, well, I'll have to go back and look at the date again. I'm like, that's, that's damage control. So there's no firm answer in Christianity. It's all a guessing game. And that's, that's the same thing you're telling me now. So the thing about it is, there's always something to blame it on. Jesus didn't say, if you believe. He said, you will, you will do these things. You'll cast out demons. You'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll become healed. I think it even talks about you'll you know, lay hands on serpents, and not, you know, they won't harm you, and all this other stuff. And people are doing this, and they're getting harmed. You know, I, I, I laugh in a, in, a, in a very strange way, because I find it, funny that they still believe that after watching all these fails and they still want to go back to having all these damage control catchphrases that somehow saves christianity for yet another year for more people to fall into yeah but listen hear me out just hear me out for a second are you there yep can i say one thing okay i know you have more than 100 reasons why you disagree and i've heard your reasons i could i could address like the flip side of the coin to that and you still, I, I don't think you would still agree, but I can tell you, I go to a church where we've had my pastor lay hands on people, and we've had people... I, I've seen that, too. Deathbed. I've seen that, too. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, but, but, I don't want to digress, though, because I know you don't agree. And Well, let me, let me tell you why I don't agree. Because miracles and signs and wonders, even, even with that said, are not proof that you're doing God's work. Uh, it's very clear in Deuteronomy, he clarified that, you know, uh, in Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18... All these are a test to see whether you will still follow the God of Tanakh or you're going to follow other gods, which is just what Jesus is. So I don't doubt that miracles happen, but miracles also happen in Hindu and in the Muslim world. So and Buddhism. And Buddhism. So does that mean that all of them are also right and Christianity is also right? Well, how does that work? Okay, I'll tell you how. Well, first of all, I was only addressing because you were saying there's no miracles that have happened, but they have. Oh, I didn't say, there, were, I didn't say there was no miracles that. that happened. I never said that. Well, you were saying that Jesus said you're going to do this and do that greater works than me. That that ha that did. He was talking to his disciples, so I've seen enough of it. Look, I, I, if you if I had two hours with you, I would tell you my side. But that's not why I'm calling. I don't want to convince you. I'm not going to. I want you to under just understand for two reasons. I'm convinced. I I, I know what I think. I know, and I walk. A, a certain route, and when I, I prayerfully do things, God doesn't mean my life is easy, but I, I, I feel like I'm steered in a certain direction, as I'm so sure you do too. The the issue with that is that 
Christians base their choices and their decisions on emotions and on feelings. They'll pray, and if they get goosebumps or they feel, if they get emotional when they pray, they really feel like God touched them. Um, but God, there's so many things that that you don't need to pray about. God told you what to do in, in Tanakh. Christians call it the Old Testament, and so, but people, Christians really like to say, "No, I want to pray about this and see what's right." You don't need ninety nine percent of every of every counseling session I've ever had. People didn't need prayer; they needed answers that they didn't have because they didn't know what the, the Tanakh said. So, the idea of of your uh, your idea of God answering your prayers and all this other stuff. It's it most of it. I'm sorry. It's 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 really when I say self-inflicting. I mean it's not God healing you on things. It's like we have the power of belief, and that's something that's very powerful. You can tell yourself to believe something. I know people who are married in of in abusive relationships, and they believe with all their heart that their husband still loves them, right? And but that because that's what the power of belief does to you, right? But the, the funny thing about Tanakh is Tanakh never says to believe in God. It says to know God. That's the big difference between Christianity and Judaism. You know God, and in, in, in Christianity is you have to believe. Why do you have to believe? Like this chair, I don't, the chair I'm sitting in, I don't believe this chair is going to hold me up. I know for a fact it's going to hold me up. I don't need to believe it's going to. It's, it's something you, you, you know, right? And so that's, that's where I find conflict. And the reason why I, I will never believe that, because I was Christian. I think if I was never a Christian before, and I wasn't a Christian teacher before, I would probably be more vulnerable to your to your opinions and to your angles, but I've already heard them all, and which is why I won't ever believe them. The issue is you haven't heard all of ours, which is why you keep coming back, right? Because we keep telling you things you like you never thought about, but then you keep reasoning through it and you keep rationalizing it to try to find answers. But everything you believe is based on emotion and experiences. Everything we believe is based on text and what's actually written. And that that I'm sorry is not an opinion. That is that's fact. Because we we prove it over and over again on the show. Okay, but can I? I didn't like I said. I'm not calling to debate you on those things because I know you your stand on the. No, I'm not. I didn't even want to talk about that part. But if he, I understand his sentiment. I'm not. A, I take issue though. I'm not a, like I'm not coming at this from emotional. If I if I'm bringing up the shroud of Turin, spoke in terms of your proof of your belief system. Your proof was the emotionality that accompanies miracles that occur um my question to you would be what and, and just out of curiosity now i'm actually curious uh when when you got say were you saved did you just were you always in church like like i know families like for me my biological father was a was a preacher so um i was exposed to that as a young child um there was a big gap there but still a lot of people i know were raised in it and they don't know how to not believe in jesus um, and then the people who never knew Jesus, like drug addicts or whatever, there was a miracle that was attained to it, which actually triggers your emotions. Uh, and some of them were just heartbreaks some people coming off bad relationships and they're, they're suicidal, you know, and they get saved. So m my question for you would be when you got saved and this, you can just, you can, you don't even have to tell me if you don't want to, but, uh, my question for you is when you got saved, um, was it purely an intellectual choice? Like, Hmm. That, that makes sense. I should stop what I'm doing right now and start following Jesus. Or was it an experience that you had, something that really happened? Was it a miracle that you experienced? Was it uh, emotional healing, uh, physical healing? H how was your interaction and how old were you when it happened? Okay, I'm, I'm glad because I want to be totally honest. I grew up in a Lutheran church and was disillusioned. And when I went to college, I walked away and I was skeptic like you. I, 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 was, I, I had all... I'm not saying all the criticisms you have, but I had a hundred doubts. Mm -hmm. So I, I dug deep, and I, I had to look, and it still took me a while. But the, okay, so uh, we're actually running. We're actually over an hour now. I'm not, I don't want you to hang up, though. Hang on, bear with me a second. Uh, yeah, but there, as my I suspicion, too, as my suspicion, my as, well. as my suspicion came, you were born into this thing, right? Uh, people who are not born into this, and they, and for the very first time, this wasn't your first time when you left college and you fell away and you came back. You came back because that's what your parents taught you, right? Uh, and and you, your natural magnetism was going to pull you back to what you originally knew, right? And maybe maybe you did that. You became a full-blooded believer, and next thing you know, 10, 20 years later, you, you find our channel, and now you're finding a problem. But you're already married to Jesus this whole time. You're not, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to divorce Jesus when you've had such a long-term relationship with him. I get that. I know how that is. Uh, my wife went through that herself as well. A lot of my friends went through the same thing. 
I didn't so much because I was abused as a kid, and probably for me that helped me to disconnect easier. But the thing about it is, is it's still every everything about Christianity, everything about the message of Christianity is all based on emotional connections, every bit of it. Right, um, people who didn't come to Jesus through emotions were born into it. You might have a rare, weird occasion where uh, another something happened, but ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, that's how it happens. And Judaism is a purely intellectual. You, there are emotional connections involved, but it's purely intellectual on in how we how we walk and talk with our Creator in Judaism. That's that's the difference between Christianity. It's not emotional. So um, go ahead. Yeah, I like Judaism, and I understand, but they have their roots passed on. I know what you're saying, but the, your people in Clearly there... Clearly, you do not know what we're saying. No, no, keep, let me... You please, keep let making me, the state. You keep making the statement that we have doubts. We do not have doubts. The reason we do not have doubts is because we believe what God said when God said every man yeah. should be put to death for his own sin. If every man is put to death for his own sin, Deuteronomy 24, 16, Jesus cannot die for our sins. Yeah. If God in Exodus chapter 32 said, whoever sins against me, him will I blot out of my book. That means the person who commits the sin is the one who gets the punishment of the sin. Or Ezekiel 18, the wickedness of the wicked is on the wicked, not the wickedness of the wicked is on the righteous. We have no doubts. We know what God said. That's why we reject Christianity because it's wrong. Yeah, it's it's not when Christianity. Like when Christianity says that Jesus became that Jesus was God in the flesh, okay. Well, my God says that God is God. Humans are humans. God does not become a human, and humans don't become God. Numbers twenty three nineteen. God is not a man that he should lie. Which means if God became a man, he'd be a liar. Hmm. We do not have doubts. If God were yeah. a man, then like all other men, God too, like all other men, would also be a liar. And Hosea 11, 9, for I am God and not a man. Ezekiel 28, 2, where a person who believed he was God was severely punished for it. We have no doubts. We know exactly what God said. That's why we reject Christianity. It falls back into the know that I am God, not believe. And that's why we don't have doubts, is because we don't have to guess. Because we know, and, and we even know even more now because uh, most of the people who subscribed to my channel were ex-Christians. Not just ex-Christians, but I'm talking about ex-preachers and teachers. I'm, I literally, just, they, they get this. that you, once, you, once you know, you know. But you can't know whenever you're still emotionally connected. That's the whole thing. Um, you, have, you have Jesus dying for you on a cross. Jesus who did the dying was Jesus the human, which means the basis of your religion is human sacrifice, we have no doubts because God told us human sacrifice is an abomination and something God hates. So w one thing I want you to take with you tonight, um, Judy, and I haven't hung up yet. I'm just we're just I'm just kind of talking to you right now. One thing I really want you to take with you tonight is um, every everything, every single thing that you have mentioned on pretty much every phone call. Every concept that you have about Christianity that you wish we believed in, every concept is wrong. That's why we interrupt so much because everything you're saying, not even part of it is right. I mean, there are times when it was like you're talking about Israel. And yeah, I'm not talking about those parts. I'm talking about the, the salvation part of our relationship with the creator of the universe. Every single thing you think that you know is wrong. That's why we have so many answers for you. We, we don't have any doubts. We've already researched it. We, most of us have walked where, you're on, where you've walked, and we've left it because we see the errors in it. You're still married exactly. to Jesus, and I get it. Like I said, I know what it feels like to be emotionally connected to uh, a person or to even, based on all my other friends and my wife, but connected, emotionally connected to Jesus. I get it. I understand how hard that is. Um, and so many people who, leave, who, who actually leave Christianity eventually wind up turning atheists because they just throw the entire Bible away. They're so heartbroken over the whole thing, they ditch everything. And I get it. But it... Whether I get it or not doesn't make Christianity right. Nothing can make Christianity right. That's the whole point. Um, and and you, you can't say, well, uh, a lot of Christianity is good so I can keep Jesus. Nothing is right about Jesus at all. I mean, the only thing that's right about Jesus is that uh, he's a guy. Uh, he was a Jew. Um, and that's pretty much it. 
because everything there's no he has he didn't fulfill a single prophecy you know which means if there if there's 365 prophecies like i see floating around the internet jesus hasn't fulfilled a single one of them not one single prophecy has he fulfilled uh he, he may fit the qualification of a couple but there's, he hasn't fulfilled any prophecies so every single thing about judy, christianity is wrong rabbi judy you you keep saying or you keep thinking or it sounds like you're thinking that if you just could explain it right, we Jews would understand, and then we would come to Christianity. And that's not what's going on. What's going on is that we've been given a revelation by God to Moses through to the Jews at Sinai, and we believe it, and that's why we reject Christianity as being unbiblical. Yeah. It's not that we don't understand. We understand it. We reject it because yeah. it's not what God said. Right. And there's nothing you can do to explain this in a way that's going to make it okay that a human being dies for someone else's sin. This is a 2,000-year-old debate that has never been won, and it never will be won for a reason. Because Judy. Christianity doesn't even understand Judy. Oh, we understand Jews. We understand what yeah. they mean. No, you don't. Because yeah. if you did, you would un at least understand it well enough to know that... How we understand the Bible, what we read in the Bible, is what leads us to reject Christian Christianity yeah, right. as unbiblical. Mm -hmm. There's no nice way to play it, or better way to put it, or if I could just get you to understand, we understand. Yeah. We reject it. It's wrong. It's unbiblical. Deuteronomy 13 says that this is a test to see who is going to keep Hashem's commandments not just not just the commandments, but all of them. The hook, the hukim. Rabbi, what are the three different types of commandments? Hukim, uh, mishpatim, and hook, mishpat, and. Anyway, the point is, old, it's a test. Is, it's a test to see uh, who is going to give in to these new religions that come up. And it says, if, if whoever leads you that way deserves deserves to die. So, um, again, it's like. It's, it's never been in the plan uh, for uh, Messiah to come to take uh, and take the place uh, and to atone for your sins. That's not what the Messiah does. The Messiah d comes whenever you stop sinning. He doesn't come to fix you from your sin. Um, and so, like again, like I said, everything that you think, every single thing that you think, ninety nine percent of it is all wrong. Um, and I, I appreciate your, your your patience and your your candor in the way you approach it with us because you're you're never rude to us. You're very kind. We appreciate that. But it's still every single thing you believe is wrong. I mean, everything is. And it's like uh, I didn't know that. I wouldn't know that if I hadn't been on the journey I was on. Like I said, going through the teaching phase myself, you know, and teaching in a big church and all this other stuff, and and having to go through this the hard way. I, I used to debate. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi, I, I didn't know if I told you this, but Rabbi Ellie Cohen from Jews for Judaism, sure. uh, he posted one one time about King David, and I went on Facebook when I was a Messianic, and I had this long debate with him. I, I just knew that I was going to be able to show him something new, and I left there scratching my head, you know, and like the year or two later, here I am, you know. <laughs> so it's like, and I was good. Man, I, I, I was I was a street preacher. I, I mean, I literally did open air preaching. I would go out on street corners and stand like these, pardon me, but these, no, I'm not going to say it. These people who were mis severely misled, going out in the corners, you know, firing brimstone. I've d I went through that phase. Um, I did all that, and it's like um, I was very dedicated. I was. I, I probably led more people to Jesus than than most people you know you've ever met as a Christian. Because I was. That's all I ever did. I was. I was very. I was almost. I almost got to the point where I was. I was very prideful about. It. I almost had like put notches in my belt. Well, there's another one. There's another one. You know. And the people around me were like agging me on, like, damn, oh, oh, William, boy, he sure knows how to reel them in. You know. I'm like, and I did because I knew all the right things to say. Everything I said is wrong. Now I've got to deal with all those people I led to, to a fake religion that's going to that's going to lead them in a path of very much much regret, and it, it breaks my heart. You know. Um, uh, Judy, some final words for you. Uh, I told you I wasn't going to hang up yet. I didn't. Uh, give us a few final words, if you like, and I'm going to go ahead and wind down yes. the show, okay? Yes, very quickly. Thank you for letting me reply. Sure. First, if you play this back, you misunderstand. I didn't say that you doubt your religion. I never said that. No, you said we, no, doubt, we, we, doubt, you said we doubt your religion. We have doubts about your I, religion. Right. And we don't. Yes, and, but we, we don't. We, we don't. We don't sure, don't. No, what I mean is you're, you're sure that I'm wrong. So yeah, we're sure. There's no doubts. It's, it's, it's an absolute fact. I mean, I'm fact. not yeah. about that. Okay, cool. I'm not, but because I don't have much time, I'll say this. Two, two responses, but let me say both, please. Okay, sure. 
w- one is that there are many messianic. Um, my best friend is a messianic Jew, and she's not stupid. Okay, there's many messianic. Oh, I don't believe any of them are stupid, stupid. But she's still wrong. I don't believe any so of them are stupid. Steve? Okay, she's wrong. All right. So that's one thing. The other thing is the Shroud of Turin. You've misquoted many things about it. I'm an expert. I wrote a book on it, and I'm telling you, the the guy, the Jewish guy, he's not even Christian. He knows all the facts up to date. He's got the website on the shroud. He says it's Jesus Christ, but he still is Jewish. Okay, so I have a question for you. Yeah, like a messianic. I, I, I did just cut you off. I turned you down because I have a question for you. Um, it's a thought, but it couples up with a question. So, um, the shroud of Turin. The only thing it shows on the shroud is that there was possibly a man's figure there because it was like a bearded figure, whatever the case may be. Right? Uh, it does not prove that anybody who was on that shroud resurrected. It doesn't prove anything. It can't, it's impossible to prove a resurrection. It can only prove that there was bloodstains from some male figure laying. That's all it can prove. It doesn't, it, it, even if it proved it was Jesus, it still doesn't prove that he died. It just doesn't. No matter, no matter what you say, there's no evidence that could actually prove that. So my question is, why do, you, why do you believe that it proves he resurrected? Okay, I, I might... I'm here. Okay, I didn't know if I was muted. Why do I believe it? No, 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 no. no. Why? Why do, you why do I believe? Why do? Why do I believe that it proves he was resurrected? Yes. First of all, the reason why it's likely Jesus. More, if you take it to a court of law, there's a crown of thorns that that have actual blood around the the head, and a spear. They call it the spear of destiny in his mother. Right, I'm not doubting. I'm not doubting. No, listen, Judy. I'm not doubting that it might be him. I'm saying, what is the proof right. that he that that that's proof of a resurrection? Okay, and first of all, I mean, more than likely, I'm just inserting this. He was brutally beaten before. Okay, so uh, I, I want to object. This is a very serious object. First, you said there's it's proof, but twice in just a couple sentences, you said more than likely and most likely. Well, if it's proof, then it's absolutely. There's no likely or most likely. So it's either absolute or it's not. Okay, so again, my question is, forget the stab wound. Let's say it was Jesus. I don't care whether it was Jesus or not. How does that shroud prove that he resurrected? That's the question. Okay. The, in a nutshell, maybe proof is a strong word, but evidence of a resurrection because it is a photo negative. It is three-dimensional. There's blood under the image. The image has been there for 2,000 years. The carbon testing has how, been... How does, that, how does that prove a resurrection? That just proves that there was a person laying there that was bleeding. That's all it proves. How does it prove a resurrection? That's the question. It, it's evidence of a resurrection. No, no, it's... it's the t- oh, oh, sorry, I, apo- I apologize. She was fixing to tell us. I can Go ahead. Tell us how it's, how it's evident of a resurrection. How? There's 10 reasons, but let me give you the two or three most. Okay? The, first of all, you got to hear one thing as background. The carbon testing has been refuted strongly, and vanillin testing by NASA physicists have aged it back to the time of Christ. Okay, that's not answering the question. For example, let's say that, let's say that I murdered somebody, God forbid, and I had a blanket, and then next year they find the blanket, now forget that. Let's let's just say I mug somebody, and you know I, maybe I thought they were dead, right? And I put them in a blanket, and I hauled them to the emergency room, whatever. And somebody found that blanket a year later, carbon dated it, did all these fancy tests that you're talking about on that blood. They won't be able to tell if that person's alive or dead by what's on the cloth. It's absolutely impossible. All they can tell is, is maybe who the blood belonged to, if they had the, uh, enough records dating far enough back, which is why I also doubt that they can prove it's Jesus, uh, because they're going on ideas. He was stabbed in the rib, and there was a rib wound. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I don't buy all that. Even if I did, it's okay. But how does that prove, and, and you're still not answering the question. You're kind of beating around the bush. I don't want maybes. You said absolute proof. If it's proof, then you can just tell me one statement, and I'll be like, oh, my God, there it is. So forget all the explanations of of special scientific terms of $50 words and all this other stuff. How does the Shroud of Turin prove a resurrection? And so far, you haven't said anything that even leads to it, except for fancy words that scientists say. Okay, here it is. You want to know the number one, the biggest evidence? You want to know the biggest evidence? That was the question from the beginning. Okay. 
the blood that they have found is underneath the image. And the image can be scraped off. The image of Christ can be scraped off with a razor blade. So he bled first. He suffered first. The blood is underneath the image. <coughs> and the image lies on top of the blood. Okay, that's the biggest... You call it maybe proof. I call it maybe evidence. How does, but how, does, how is that even My evidence? Of a, but how is that even evidence of a resurrection? All that's going to show is somebody was laying there who was bleeding. That's all that proves. It, isn't, it does not prove a resurrection. I don't know who told you this, but there's no way that could prove a resurrection. It can only prove that there was a man laying there. It only mad because they, they had a, a facial negative of whatever. I am kind of curious, by the way, how his hair impression got on the front of it when hair falls, whatever. The thing was laid over his face. That was kind of weird. Um, but, again, it doesn't prove anything. In fact, it, in fact it, 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 it doesn't, it's not even connected to a resurrection or a imminent death. All it shows is that somebody was laying there who was bloody. That's all it proves. Can, I, can, I, make, can I make a request, though, please? Go ahead. I am reading from Radiocarbon Dating of the Shroud of Turin, Wikipedia. The Shroud of Turin, a linen cloth, a tradition associates with the crucifixion and burial of Jesus, has undergone numerous scientific tests, the most notable of which is radiocarbon dating in an attempt to determine the relic's authenticity. In 1988, scientists at three separate laboratories dated samples from the Shroud of Turin to between 1260 and 1390 CE coinciding with the first certain appearance of the shroud in the 1350s and a much later date than the burial of Jesus in 30 to 33 CE. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about when you say that the shroud of Turin was carbon dating, carbon dating to 2000 years ago. It's just simply not true. I think what's happening too is that uh, just like you can't find any evidence of Jesus in anything except for the New Testament. Uh, there's, there's, there's Josephus writings that they say those were, those weren't his original writing. That looks like that was that they actually kind of uh, did a little play, not plagiarism, but they actually inserted writings into the complete works of Josephus uh, because it's not his writing style. Uh, but just like that, uh, the whole shroud of Turin thing in the Christian academic world, they're using this as their own proof, but it's that, but it's the only proof for them because they're trying to prove that it was him when there's no proof. You know what I mean? And so that that's why we have such a big problem with it. By the way, you also may want to take a look, Judy. You're st uh, I haven't hung up. By the way, just so you know, Judy. Okay. Take oh. a look at Nature Magazine. Actually, actually, she hung up on us. That was the first. So maybe maybe. Something finally. Okay. You know, 1989 Nature magazine. Yeah. Okay, a well attended press conference on October 13. Cardinal Balistrero announced the official results that radiocarbon testing dated the shroud to between 1260 and 1390 with 95% confidence. Hmm. The official and complete report on the experiment was published in the in the magazine Nature. Okay, well, that, that's kind of a good read. we got a couple callers on, but it's getting late. Just so you know, we'll have 10 years. November, uh, the month of November, I don't know the exact date, but November will mark 10 years Tanakh Talk has actually been on the air. I'm uh, very excited about that. To support uh, my work here at the channel where I have all the different rabbis and teachers, uh, and a lot of people go straight to the rabbis and support them. I also do, unfortunately, need your help. So if I really ask you to consider donating to this channel on a regular basis if you can. Um, Tanakhtalk.com, there's a link there. There's also a Patreon link I'll probably have at the end of the video on an ad. If you guys have the means, please consider supporting it. I'm plugging it now because I've did an analysis over the past six months, and donation has dropped a lot on my side. Of course, I never talk about it. I only put the ad up there. And your support is definitely needed for sure. I have gigs that I do in the evening to help pay the bills, and sometimes it's uh, it requires more than less. But uh, if you guys have some to spare, please send it in. I can certainly use it to help us out with this channel. And also with Rabbi Stuart Federo, you you may or may not know, most of you do know, uh, he's got a new video out on the HebrewJumpstart.com. That's the website, HebrewJumpstart.com. Uh, one of the best Hebrew teaching lessons out there from what the comments section says. Um, and since Rabbi is actually uh, retired now, retired without the benefits of retirement, um, there, this is one of the things that hopefully will help him soften his daily landing uh, because there's a workbook that you guys can download for like 10 bucks or whatever it is to actually work along with this to expedite your learning 
experience through the Hebrew language, and this is really, really good. Um, so uh, HebrewJumpStart.com, you want to go there and catch that. And also, uh, most of you already have this book, and I took the image down. Rabbi, where's your book at? Judy, just hand me hold up one of them. This, to me, this is one of the most dynamic, small, easy reads uh, that you can buy. That's um, got uh, uh, all the sources you need to answer so many questions. Um, it quotes a lot of Rabbi Singer's work. Uh, of course, he is like the granddaddy of us all. In this the one in Spanish. Yep. And then in Portuguese. Here's the one in Portuguese. Do you have one at Redneck? Uh, no. I'll have to. Be. I'll have to edit that one for you. That's another translation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But we really appreciate you guys too. Thank you so much for my moderators out there. You guys rock. Uh, they're staying on top of things, and uh, it makes it makes it easier for me to uh, to do my uh, do my show with Rabbi and not have to babysit the channel too much. I do like looking at the channel comments though. There's a lot of good stuff going on there. A lot of great questions I can't get to. Um, but yeah. So, Rabbi, love you much. You're awesome. You did a great job too. as usual. And, oh, I don't know what I was going to say. Uh, so, earlier on, the question about Zechariah, it, it was kind of like it, it took a little bit of time. We didn't really get anywhere with it. Uh, and since we've got an hour and 20 minutes on this video, I'm going to probably take the, the, those questions out that didn't seem to go anywhere. I'm going to delete those and keep these New Testament questions in, splice it together, probably make one nice little hour package video out of this one. And uh, what I'm telling you right now, also will be uh, edited out. So <laughs> you won't see this if you go back and watch the video. Um, okay, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Turn on all notifications. That way when I put comments up there or post or share videos, you will catch everything. Uh, you guys should have a great week. Rabbi, love you much. And y'all well, have, have a great week. Take care. Peace, everybody. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafa.